So thank you, Nathan. Um, okay. So uh, Nathan is supporting us with the tech stuff. So if at all you see anything that's that's uh, not working for me, please let me know, Nathan, and uh, and you as well. If, if at any point there's any disturbance in the network and stuff, just feel free to let me know. We'll just sort that out. I would rather that we don't have disturbances in the way we are communicating. Okay. Cool. So all those logistics aside, I want to welcome everybody. We'll just do a quick uh, something that's very close to my heart and my culture, which is an invocation. Uh, an invocation is um, sometimes people around me that I work with misunderstand it as a prayer, but it's it could be a prayer, but an invocation is more about setting a certain direction of alignment and um, sort of setting the, the mind, body, and energy towards a certain direction. So when we're talking about something uh, with a, a theme with, with words like breath and decolonization and pedagogy, and I think there's, there's so much out there and, and 90 minutes is hardly going to be able to put it, uh, you know, do justice to it. So I, for one, for my own sake, feel like I need to slow down, breathe, you know, and say that, okay, I'm going to take it slow and we're going to see what's going to come up and see how things go. So this is captured beautifully in one of the little couplets that uh, a, a saint in India has written a long time ago. It's a very, just a couple of lines. So I'll just put that up. We'll start with that uh, invocation and the translation is there on the screen for you. If you would like to understand what the lines mean, just give me one second and let me put it up. धीरे धीरे रे मना धीरे सब कुछ होए धीरे धीरे रे मना धीरे सब कुछ होए माली सींचे सौ घड़ा ऋतु आए फल होए ऋतु फल होए धीरे धीरे रे मना धीरे सब कुछ हो धीरे धीरे रे मना Thank you so much. Um, so let's get started. Before uh, we get into the, the theme of it, I also wanted to share a little bit about who I am and why I'm sharing about this theme today and what is the context from which I'm coming from. Because one thing I have uh, sort of come to understand in my own journey is that talking about things that are out there is just, just the beginning, right? It's ideas and thoughts and everything that's floating out there. But what really transforms my life is what is true in my experience and what is a reality for me, what's my lived realities. So I feel uh, a little bit of context around uh, the role that breath has played in my life and my journey is something that might be relevant. Uh, but a long story short, my name is Kaushik Pranu and I, I live in the southern part of India. I run this pro uh, program or initiative called Unlearning Ashram, uh, which I think sort of captures the essence of my journey, which, over the last 10 years, uh, where I've been traveling, exploring, really slowing down and trying to understand different aspects of my life. And a part of that has been truly the essence of all of that diverse experiences has been a journey of unlearning for me, from how I sit, what I wear, uh, how I speak, to what I eat, and from the basics of life towards love, leadership, transforming the world or transforming myself, whatever the scale of work that I want to do and exp my experience of life have all been under scrutiny where I've wanted to really check, is this what I really want to do with my life? And that has been a fantastic unlearning process by itself. So my journey with breathing as such uh, is relevant in, in a couple of ways. One is because of the programs that I'm uh, doing, which is constantly engaging with people around these themes. I do a 
11 day deep dive engagement with people called breathe which is to experientially take people through uh, the the science of breath work and also i do a program called listen breathe and see uh, which is very close to my heart which is my foundational program which is uh, experientially for people to experiment and learn and unlearn about the three most fundamental senses that i think open up for people you know when we are in the womb the listening opens up as the first thing and then we come out breath happens and then uh, there is seeing the eyes open up but just these three aspects if we learn to keep it well if you really know the depth of these three things i felt personally that our lives and the world can transform tremendously so uh, this has been the foundation of some of my work i also do uh, one on one consultations where i engage with people to talk about an aspect of life that is not just about survival and i call this program aliveness because uh, to be alive is not just to be not in a moment of crisis it's not about crisis management it's about really um, being alive being complete moving towards a sense of wholeness and celebration of life so in all these uh, different work that i do breath has been a fundamental role uh, because th- it is a fantastic tool with which we i am looking at self transformation and transforming the quality of work that we do the second part of how i'm connected to breath in my journey is that when in my own unlearning journey the thing that hit me most was that something as fundamental as breath i had absolutely no idea about and that is what opened me up towards really slowing down asking what the hell have i been doing all my you know all these years with all this educational degrees i had an engineering degree i was planning to go abroad and do an international program and uh, i was working in a corporate and then i realized okay let's let's time out let's just stop and really ask questions and somehow my life from there took me to work living with indigenous communities in south india where i really learned what unlearned i would rather say what uh, living with nature meant what sustainability meant and what living in communities meant and their ideas of indigenous systems and how they can radically de- and how they have radically decolonized my learning and whatever i think i was holding so um this has been a very alive entity within me and uh, when we are talking about um both in terms of radically thinking of a new pedagogy i think breath can be an ultimate key in deconstructing uh, the mainstream ideas of how we look at life and how we learn and how knowledge is created within us in the first place we'll go into all of that but i feel uh, it would be nice to have hear a few voices and talk so one question i would like to like put out there and you can unmute and share if you want or you can also use the chat box whatever is comfortable for you uh this is a very basic simple question so what are your ideas of breath when i and you think of the word breathing when you think of the theme of breathing let's do it this way let's think of words and phrases that come up to you come up for you right so anything that coming up for you there's no right and wrong answer so don't worry about that uh, that's something we'll also unlearn so just whatever comes up can you just quickly put it out there let me also read it out circulation air rhythm <laughs> life life mindfulness spirit extremes amazing biomechanics fantastic creative source of existence okay expansiveness expansiveness right good to hear voices also <laughs> present absolutely amazing biomechanics i agree with that okay all right anybody else if you have anything else to share please put it on the chat we we'll let others also get to read that <clears throat> so this is something i enjoy doing you know whenever i used to travel i have conversations with people and especially when i'm working with children both from the indigenous communities and as well as you know i'm a city bred person so wherever i come and meet my friends this was a question that i used to have asked like a you know fun uh, trivia thing that what do you know about breath and and what can you tell me about breath is there something that you you've learned about your breath yeah. and um, yeah. interestingly what i heard was a lot of the words and the themes that came up was this uh, this amazing uh, set of information that we have gathered about the biomechanics 
about uh, the biochemistry of the body, the, the anatomy and physiology of our human system, right? So there's carbon dioxide and, and kids know they're very enthusiastic. So they're all about oxygen, lungs, oh, this happens, there's hemoglobin, there's exchange. And it's fantastic to see the, the amount of knowledge in, in terms of information that they've gathered. But what really turned things around for me was to ask myself, okay, that is one half of the story, but what about the second half? And when I started asking, what is the second half about? That's when I talked to other people like elders in the village or other, other uh, people in other professions. And they talked about a completely different aspect of breathing. For example, we know that um, if, you, if you climb a mountain, the breath changes. If you're angry, your breath changes. Um, maybe you're, you're working out a cardio uh, you know, routine and your breath changes. If you're, if you're going through stress, anxiety, there's a variation of breath. This is an everyday experience for people, right? But if you also look at it, even in terms of the work that we are doing, we look at uh, whether it's dance, whether it's body movement or singing or sports, martial arts, if you're into archery or shooting, uh, you know, uh, rifles, uh, any of these things, the breath becomes absolutely vital, you know, how you hold the breath, how you're breathing. And I'm sure some of you must have experienced this at some point. It's, even if you're doing a, a routine activity like driving a car, if you push it to the extreme, if you're taking it to, say, high speeds, you know, really going into a NASCAR kind of driving, then every breath you take is, becomes important because then you're looking at a very fine-tuned way of applying the human system. So as we get into subtler and subtler aspects of life, breath obviously becomes important. In fact, I was fascinated when I was talking to um, a nurse, somebody who's in the medical field, and, and they, were, they, were talking, they were talking about this, uh, I think it's called Shane Stokes breathing, which is a peculiar pattern of breathing that people go through and they know that the person is at the end of their life, right? And it's a very occupational knowledge that they receive because, because of the, the, the nature of their occupation, they're able to notice, okay, this is happening in the human system. And this started making me question about what else can I know about my breath? You know, how do how much attention am I paying with the breath? If I really look at it, um, <coughs> for all of us, I think this is true. That when we come out of the womb, uh, they clear up the cavities, the nose, and the mouth. Uh, in 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 earlier times, it used to be at least in the rural places. I I went through this. That the child is held upside down by the legs and then they pat the child, right? So my uncle used to bully me saying that, hey, they, they spanked you as a child. <laughs> That's how you, were, you came into the world. So I used to feel so bad about this. Then I found out that it was very essential. That's the first breath of life that a, that a child takes. Today, of course, we have these suction devices. But that's the first intake of breath, right? And after all this life that, you know, experiences that we go through, the last exhalation that we take, in, out, in, out, it goes for years. And then one day there is an out breath. And then there is no more in-breath. And there ends the story of this journey, at least. So if you really look at it, it's sort of the life starts with an in-breath and ends with an out-breath. And everything else happens in between, right? So I started getting fascinated by this. And I started exploring a whole host of things, both in terms of modern science and in terms of the esoteric sciences and the traditional systems, especially yoga, uh, and my own personal experience and the indigenous uh, spiritual forms that people have in different ways. So now that we're talking about um, breath as something, I wanted to understand how can this really help me? Like, is this about just breathing and uh, what do I get out of this? You know, that's the, that's the training that has gone into me because of the education system. Like, okay, I look at something, how do I make use of it? When I started looking at it deep enough, I realized that the breath has such an enormous connection with so many aspects of whatever it is that I think is myself. Can we do a simple experiment because I don't want it to be just my, me talking. Uh, I wanted to see if we can just experientially see uh, what's happening with our breath right now, but we do it in a specific way. We'll try, um, if wherever you are, if you are standing, the, it'll be preferable to sit down, however you want to sit down, just sit comfortably and keep your palms open like this, facing upwards on your lap, your thighs, um, and just sit comfortably. If you're uh, resting your head, you can just bring that up. 
and when i say switch or flip all you have to do is just shift your hands the other way around okay and then when i say flip or switch again then you can open it back up all right all you have to do in between uh, meanwhile is just to watch your breath and see if you can notice any difference anything happening at all as we are doing this experiment okay can we just try this out all right so let's start with the palms open and try and close your eyes and see if you can just be with your breath just breathe normally and see if you can just pay attention to how the breath is entering your nostril filling your lungs and then how it's leaving your body now please flip switch keep your palms facing downwards Can you flip again open your palms see if you can do it by yourself experiment and see if you can keep your palms closed just give it some time between the switches and open it again you come back gently whenever you're ready gently open your eyes <clears throat> were you able to notice anything any if you didn't that's totally fine it's perfectly fine all right but if you did i would like love to hear what happened did you notice anything where did you notice it what happened anybody you can also put it up on the chat if you don't feel like speaking or please we should yeah so so i felt more grounded with my with my all my hands turned down down um, okay felt a bit airy and unstable so with my hands turned open mm. yeah. okay thank you for sharing that you can take one or two more people please please go ahead. yeah i'm not Hi. sure if it was because oh, oh sorry. sorry go ahead you <laughs> first you first All right. Um I'll be quick. I don't know if it was because I was paying attention to my breath or what else, but um when I flipped so downwards, I just felt it could go deeper. My breath would mm -hmm. start deeper in my my belly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, "Oh, okay, something happened." But then when I flipped again, it just kept being larger. So that's why I'm not sure if it was because of switching or because I was just paying attention. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, Emma. So the mouth is nice and chat. Please go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah, um <clears throat> when I switched to the down position, I automatically sensed a kind of condensing in the top half, so in my head. Mm. Like so yeah, it was really noticeable. And then when I opened again, it felt a lot easier. Mm. So when when I went down, it felt I suppose it went into head and felt a little bit more stressed, I suppose. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I think there's one on the uh, Alex has also shared on the chat and uh, Vivian is saying it, the experience is similar with Emma's. So let me just uh, share one thing that happens is uh, I wanted to start with something very basic because what happens when you flip your hands is something very physiological. It's not even very subtle. It is subtle at the physical level, but it's very physical what happens. So I usually uh, ask people to figure it out for themselves. You know, I don't want to spoil the magic and suspense, but since we have very limited time, let me just share this. Um, at some point, whether 
I, I won't tell you which one. I'll still, I would love for you to figure it out and like experiment and find out for yourself. Either when you do this or when you do this, your diaphragm shifts a little bit, okay? So because the, the diaphragm is the muscle just below uh, your lungs and as it moves up or down, it creates different levels of spaciousness for the lungs to breathe in case you didn't notice. So as you flip your hands in one way or the other, there's a certain movement of the diaphragm that allows you to breathe a little better. Okay. When I say breather, better, it brings a certain ease. It might be very subtle. It might be very, you might experience it as just ease. You might notice it as a physical shift. Okay. You might notice it as a shift in the, in the depth of your breathing. One hint I'll give you is that when people are trying to be earnest or be very honest or trying to, you know, explain themselves to somebody or trying to be reasonable. Have you noticed that the body language tends to open up like this? It's a very, hey, this is what I'm trying to say. And, and there's, a, there's a sort of need to create a certain ease within the system. And that's finding expression unconsciously like this. Okay. So uh, I think, yeah, the, the hint was very obvious. So obviously when you keep the palms open, the diaphragm shifts downward. So the, there's a little more spaciousness for your lungs to breathe. This is, this is just the human mechanism, the way it's designed. Of course, for a few people, there might be exceptions. But uh, if at all you, your experience of this was different, it might be something to do with how you're paying attention to your breath. Okay. When we say breath watching, if I ask you to watch your breath, okay, uh, this is also a fun thing I play with, uh, you know, uh, friends that I engage with. But when we, in, uh, whenever I say breath watching, can we please watch our breath? People don't watch their breath. They, you know, in India particularly, they, everybody's exposed to something or the other. So they sit all cross-legged, they like sit up straight, they keep their palms in some, you know, some mudra or formation and then they're like going all like this. And I asked them, hey, I just asked you to watch your breath. You can just do it while you're watching me. You're just do, taking your notes. I didn't ask you to do all this. But there's a very unconscious connection between sitting like this or doing it a certain way because there, we make certain associations with you know, um, maybe culturally, maybe intuitively about what will let us breathe better and what is the you know, best way for us to bring our attention towards the breath. And almost all the people who are trying to, you know, at least in my experience, I'm saying, almost all the people who tried for the first time are struggle with not altering their breath. You can try it right now. If you've not done this before, if I say, okay, just try to pay attention to your breath, inevitably, you'll want to probably take a deeper breath or try and arrange it differently, or try and have it evenly, or try and shorten it. Because there are ideas about how breathing should be, and then try and fit that into your experience of breathing, because what if something's wrong, right? And the skill of watching the breath is about just watching the breath. It's, it's I would say, one of the biggest uh, shifts that have happened to me is to learn to be with something. And that's where I'm... I'm going to fundamentally connect breath watching and breath work and breathing with this idea of the pedagogical systems that we have uh, in, our, in our experience so far, at least in the mainstream communities. Because when I grew up, my education systems taught me different approaches towards learning knowledge. One of the approaches was that aim for more, yes? the more knowledge I gather, the more you know, exposure that I have. It's a very uh, logical, statistical, I would even say you know, masculine way of sort of trying to get a sense of things that you get enough data and then you draw like a mean line around it. You sort of tend to get towards what's the idea of it, right? You tend to get more and more uh, towards guessing the right thing. But if you look at our own experience, for example, if you're looking at the ideal way of say mental health or uh, you know physical BMI, whatever it is, if you really draw, take data like this and draw a line in between, you'll find that there are hardly any points exactly on the line, right? Nobody is going to be ever perfectly on the line, but everybody will be moving towards that line. It's almost like fashion. We keep following it, but I don't know if you'll ever catch up to it. I don't know if I will ever catch up to it. So it's always going to be something in pursuit, right? Um, I don't know why I went for fashion. Happiness is what we like. That's the that's larger thing that there is always a pursuit of. Oh, my whole life is in pursuit of happiness. But uh, I wanted to see if we can shift this whole approach 
of gathering more. But I'll come to that. The second part of the knowledge system that I was taught about is in terms of information, right? There's a lot of information that I was taught about. That's what we looked at in the beginning part of uh, bre breathing being about carbon dioxide or oxygen or the lungs and the physiology. It's not that it's wrong, but it's still an incomplete version because it still does not take into account the experiential dimension of who I am and how I experience things. Granted, it's not always applicable uh, to, you know, uh, standardizing things. But the way I look at uh, my own learning journey, I found that very broadly categorizing learning happens in three formats. One is learning through information. Maybe I'm traveling to a new country. I would like to know what language to speak. What is the right thing to do in terms of the culture? Where do I go for this information? Where do I, you know, uh, I need to know the basics, right? But information, if you see, is fundamentally um, a survival process, right? If I'm in the forest, I need to know, okay, what to eat, what not to eat, what to avoid, where not to go, where not to step into, and what kind of creatures to avoid. This is a very fundamental survival process, which, you know, we've passed on in, in, in tradition, we've passed it on traditionally, right? Like in, in the past, it was always like generations of knowledge being passed on traditionally. There's culture built around it. Then people wrote books, then books became a way of storing information. Now we have digital information storages. And somehow information gathering has been, we're also in the information era, apparently, uh, I was told so, where we're stacking up information as a way of knowing the world around us, even within us, right? If I start yoga, people thought, start talking to me about chakras and this and that. And I'm like, I have, no, I have been on this path for 12 years. I have not yet experienced a chakra even once. Of course, I can make, imagine things up, visualize things, but it's still not in my experience yet. Okay, so that's learning through information. The second one is learning by doing, which is now catching up at least in the, in the circles that I am part of. People are wanting to, you know, put their hands on, uh, you know, objects to create things and get down there and, you know, do things out there and see what learning comes out of that. And there are aspects of doing uh, knowledge and learning that will only happen if we, if we get our hands dirty, right? My father keeps telling me, oh, you will only understand what it means to be a parent when you get there. You know, it doesn't matter how much you learn about it. And it's as simple as falling in love. Like I might watch a hundred movies, read books about it, support my friends with it. But when I myself fall in love, then it's a completely different experience. But I have to get out there and do something about it. Right? As I'm doing, I learn. I, I, in the process of doing, I learn. The third aspect uh, that I'm looking at is learning or knowledge through direct observation or direct perception. And for me, this has been revolutionary in the sense that I came to understand that all the knowledge systems in the world, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm curious to see if I've missed out on something. All the knowledge systems that exist in this world today have their roots in the system of direct perception. Um, we do this very uh, subconsciously in our, in our business schools and art schools today, very effortlessly, right? So they tell you that uh, in business, if you want to succeed, you have to look at the market like everybody does, but see an opportunity that somebody doesn't, nobody else sees, right? Or if you're looking at art, you look at the same thing that other people are seeing, but you are seeing it from a way, in a way that other people cannot see. So when, you, when we get to the niche aspects of life when learning, then it becomes important the quality of our perception becomes very important. How we perceive, what we perceive is something that is of um, immense importance. Even in science, right? I love the story of Michael Faraday because he was a person who was book, binding books. He had no formal knowledge and he was a, a, assisting somebody in the lab. And that man who was not even found, you know, uh, qualified enough to enter by his own mentor to enter the Royal Academy of Sciences discovered electromagnetic principles with which the, the motors and the generators um, run. And if you look at our lives today, everything from the you know, PC that we are running to the lights and the fan, everything have their source in one big generator running somewhere, generating current and all the motors that are rolling around. It's so, sort of defined the fabric of our electrical reality today. So it just came from a simple act of observation that he was able to do. And even in the in the spiritual sciences, even in the esoteric terms, 
if you see any of the uh, yogic sciences or any of the indigenous practices it's because people were able to sense and see or perceive something that through direct perception that they passed on as traditions that they passed on as methods and systems but the origin always goes back to a sense of perception right if you really look at it learning by doing also needs the sense of perception right you can do the same things i don't know if you've had this experience i've had teachers who you who like boasting this uh, boasting about this they're like oh my experience is not you know your age is not even my experience you know my experience is more than your age uh, but i i found them to be i'm sorry but very crappy teachers because it doesn't it didn't matter that they were doing something but because they were not paying attention to what they're doing the doing itself doesn't transform it is possible to do something and not let it transform me because i don't know how to perceive what i'm doing if i don't let it really hit me if i'm not paying attention then it doesn't happen so if attention is the is the seed of all knowledge of all knowing then what investments have we done as a species or at least in our own lives to build this muscle to sharpen this tool within us and that's a question that i come back to because i've been told um you know my cousin who is like 4 years old can do things with a with a phone and a gadget that i cannot imagine doing okay uh, and the way they they're able to manipulate digital devices today i'm like okay i feel so old when i'm around this in this like next generation because it's almost like they come updated with the latest version of android or ios when they come out of the womb you know they just know how to, how things work and i'm struggling with the interface here so it's like something about the information part we've covered fairly well but the ability to perceive is something that differs for different people right depending on how well you pay attention to your uh, system and your your business or your education or your life that's what is going to really transform something for us and today when we're looking at wellness spaces whether we're looking at uh, professions they're all trying to teach us this thing only when you see something then you you need the information to know what to do and how to apply and then the rest of it comes the information comes in as an add on uh, to do something about what i perceived right but perception is the foundation so why I'm, why i'm coming back to this is because if you look at breath it is also the seed of attention um why i'm saying this is because if you look at the the spiritual sciences or if you look at any spiritual sciences that are talked deeply enough about the breath because i've explored it through yoga but i've also seen this in other spaces one of the strong things that they're noticing is that the way the macrocosm is designed and the microcosm is designed are not two very separate things right so i'll give you a quick uh, example um let's see if i have that picture here So this is um somebody did this beautiful visual depiction of this uh, the watershed systems and the the water pathways that they have mapped for the entire globe okay i don't know if it's uh, visible enough but if you can zoom in you'll see this network of uh, crazy criss crossing pathways all around the world let's see if we can find it for india for instance if you look at that there's an elaborate network and system of um you know water pathways and this is basically the watershed system that they have mapped and let me show you something else that i think you might find interesting this is actually not a very detailed map but this is a map of one of the texts talking about the energy pathways in the human system okay um the, i know the depiction here is slightly different but if you really uh, understand how people have sensed and and uh, figured out this energy systems in the human body there are 72000 junction points where the energy channels are meeting and you know uh, separating away so this is an elaborate system like we've heard of the seven chakras probably you must have read something or heard about something but chakras are basically meeting points where the circuitry in the system is allowing energy to flow through right and this circuitry is what they've mapped for the human body and there are 72000 junction points and there is an elaborate science that talks about how you can work with each of those points and how they feed into each other uh, and there is a beautiful way in which 
this energy that's flowing through this the human body which is called uh, the life force or in yoga it's called prana that is what powers the entire human system and it sort of reminds me of the rivers flowing through because if the water doesn't flow through the land then there is no life and here if the life force doesn't flow through this human system there is no life and um, this uh, life force that we are talking about is called interestingly in the yogic term the yogic terminology for breath and life force is one and the same it's called prana right that means they didn't really distinguish the physical aspect of breathing from the very life force itself which is why by tapping into breath awareness it is possible for us to really get into a an a very deep insight of the in, inner workings of the human system and given that the macrocosm and the microcosm are reflections of each other at least uh, the way people have seen it it is said you know there's this very beautiful story about how uh, the first yogi the uh, shiva is known as the first uh, uh, yogi who taught uh, this the science of it so there's a lore story in the lore that he says how do we understand the questions of the cosmos how do we understand the universe and then uh, it's it is said that he said oh don't worry about the universe your universe i can wrap it up into a little mustard seed you know there's actually a point where he says that and it's not in a literal sense because what it's really trying to say is that the way a mustard seed is done and the way the universe is elaborate care has gone into the intricacies of that design if you really look at it you can take a mustard seed and study it for your entire lifetime right there's so many details and depths to it because it's such a complicated process of life that's created it there's so many dimensions you can look at a mustard seed so what they're essentially saying is that it reflections of each other the macrocosm and the microcosm and if at all we are interested in any form of mindfulness work or awareness work no matter what tradition that you're going in the breath has always been used as a very significant vehicle to improve this uh, aspect of the human system and which is why i feel that breath work or whatever form of breath work in yoga it's called pranayama but in different aspects if we if we don't incorporate breath work as a fundamental aspect of our learning process this is like uh, learning to polish the tool with which we are exploring the world so without a sense of awareness the beautiful analogy that i was told is like um, you can stay in a dark room and have a small light small lamp right and what what um, the breath work does is that it sort of pumps in more and more voltage into that lamp or more and more light into that luminosity to that lamp and without having to move to every space and seeing what's there what's there if you just light up if you're holding the sun in your hands then everything is lit up on its own right so that's what uh, the awareness analogy talks about that awareness is it's not unidirectional it's everywhere it's like it's just turned on right and to get to a state of awareness like that the most important vehicle that is used traditionally at least in yoga is the breath why this is important is because the breath is relevant to how the body is how the mind is and today there are uh, endless studies that are i think i think coming up recently talking about um, how the mental health systems are uh, can be shifted around by just manipulating or i want to manipulate but managing the breath so i was just looking at some of these studies uh and i don't know if i'm yeah it's going here different spaces they've been talking about how they're using breath work consciously to see how it's bringing about stress reduction or like better sleep and anxiety control um and this is the kind of studies that are happening right now but intuitively because they were able to pay attention to it without having to quantify and generalize it the way science is doing right now which is important but within the human experience itself if you are able to travel within all of this was known because there are so many methods that are very elaborately designed to see how to control and bring about a certain balance within the human system uh and i have read about uh, aspects of yoga that talk about you know how to keep your breath when you're going for a political meeting how to keep your breath when you go for war how to keep your breath when you're going to uh, you know conceive a child how to keep your breath when you want to hit on somebody and like you know look for a prospective lover elaborate systems and i'm not saying all of this is true just because it's written down somewhere 
but I'm saying the possibilities of knowing uh, the applications of breath is phenomenal. In fact, even if you look at it very physically today, uh, this recent study that was talking about how children breathe as infants det determines how their, uh, you know, the mouth area develops and how the, our facial features also develop. So there's so many aspects of, of our lives that is being determined by breath. Um, if you've noticed this for yourself, if it's a simple thing that you can check and see, if you just cross your arms like this and, and lower down, if you do this, and you see, especially if you're, if you're uh, you know, uh, watching something that's very disturbing, uh, or if it's something very, very uh, unsettling, you tend to go here, right? And when we do this, uh, I, I, when I facilitate safe spaces and we work with, you know, uh, deep sharings, one thing we notice is that people go into this kind of mode, they cross their legs, cross their arms, they just close their bodies, and then we consciously ask them to open it up because the body shift sort of changes their emotions. But what is also shifting along the way is the breath that changes the very chemistry of the mind and the body. And because the breath is the underlying foundation of the body and the mind and your life energies itself, paying attention to the breath and bringing it as part of the learning process, there are so many levels to it. So if you're going through 12th grade, you can start with basic breath watching by kindergarten, I would say. And then like, by the time you're finishing college, you should be doing advanced level of breath work because the way we can perceive even the education system, even if you're going through mainstream education systems, the amount of what you'll be able to receive and what you'll be able to perceive with even the mainstream information can be significantly different if we are learning to work with this, um, this, this aspect of our experience. So I'll end here. I just thought um, just to give a sense of um, why we were looking at breath and the idea that we are decolonizing here, because I use the word uh, decolonizing in the, in the theme, the important thing I feel that we need to decolonize here in summary to look at is the fact that information is not necessarily the only way to know, right? It's not about amassing because naturally when I'm thinking in terms of information, I want to gather more. The shift that we're trying to do here is to take something less and look at it deeply enough. Can we look, think in terms of intensivity than extensivity? And can we start learning to look within and to polish our you know, tools of perception? And for that, breath work is the fundamental um, you know, I would say it's a fundamental science for, for improving the, in the skill of perception within a human being. So what we can do now at this point is that I would like to hear some reflections. Maybe uh, if you have something to share, if you have something to add, if you have, uh, we'll have a few minutes in the end for questions. But after this, what I thought we'll do is sort of see if we can go into an experiential, uh, you know, sort of a, I won't call it a ceremony, but it's a practice but we'll sort of do it in a ceremonial way. There are different uh, aspects to it. So there are like two or three different things we'll do together where we'll try and be with the breath because learning to be with something is the fundamental shift that we're talking about, right? When you're talking about the breath, it's not just knowing about the breath. It's not reading about the breath. It's being with something. And uh, we'll see how that plays out for us as we're doing this process. But for now, I would like to take about like a few minutes and here, if you have any reflections, sharing, uh, I mean, additions. Anyone? Um, so I, I got very interested in this idea of having, because of course we know that breath is important and breath, you know, is, makes all the difference, but uh, what you said about breath work being part of a curricular um, development as a child and as a teenager and on and on. And what you said, so by kindergarten, you should be able to do this kind of exercise and then you go into this PhD level of breathing. Um, I found that quite interesting. Um, and it made me wonder, um, in your experience, uh, how did you build, or if you're building, or I don't know, um, that kind of path, developmental path. Um, and, and the one thing I know about breathwork, I think it's even a registered trademark, is a, 
it's a process where you do a very intense breathing <laughs> and then you alter your ox oxygen level in your blood and then you can reach different levels of consciousness so i've done it a few times with uh, therapist friends and it's 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 beautiful it's amazing it's also quite uh, frightening at some point so like you um you can you face a very um how can i say spiritual process you can face like dark sides of you uh that need enlightenment um so that's as far as i know and and for example i've done the vipassana process and spent four days paying attention to breathing and uh, anapana yeah. um but i always done these things like very um like in the moment in the event i never thought of it as a long process so i would love even if not now maybe another time to hear about that longer journey you may have uh designed or other people you know that do that thank you Thank you. So I just wanted to add one thing to that. Uh, this this fascinating idea that I heard when, when my mother was reading a book, you know, uh, when I was a child, and she told me about this thing that um, it is said that if you just learn to be with your breath, just watch your breath from wherever you start, whenever you start in your life till the end of your in, in end of your life. That is all that is needed to to know the secrets of the universe and life or whatever it is that you want you know whether you're talking enlightenment or whether we're talking about nirvana and whatever your spiritual aspirations might be that is because for those of you who are into yoga and other things you might know that there are many complex things right you need you hold your body in contorted poses and there are different kinds of energy processes and rituals and this and that but the most fundamental thing that they're talking about is just being aware of the breath and I have to say this, I've been doing this for 12 years and I would not even con consider myself a novice in this, like, because it's, it's the, um, the, the most fascinating thing that I've learned is that one, we need to shift direction. We sort of reset the compass and say, okay, I can walk a thousand miles outward, but nothing's going to shift in my experience of life unless I take one step inward, right? So that, that directional shift is very important. But once directional shift happens, because in my work, I've, I've only pay attention to two things. One is experientially sharing whatever I'm sharing, because without experience, no matter how much we talk, it's just inspiration. It might motivate us to go dig, dig, dig things up a little further. But uh, the usual route that I was too lazy to take was to hear something and then take it up. And then I, I try to apply it in my life. Like, okay, I hear about compassion. I read about compassion. And I kind of remind myself to be compassionate all the time. But this becomes a very effortful process, is it not? Yeah. Uh, because when, when I'm backed against the wall, when, when things are really cornering me, then I'm no longer in, in control of what I'm doing. And then I lose it. And then I'm no longer able to remind myself effortfully. Because the cost of the amount of effort that I have to put in, in more and more stressful situations will keep rising. And after a point, no amount of effort is going to help me remind myself and I lose it. Right. And then I go through into the spiral of guilt and, we, oh, what did I do and what has happened to me? Oh, God, this is not working for me. And then there's a whole process that follows after that. There's another aspect of uh, looking at things, which is sort of in the direction of perception alone, which is to say that seeing is the only doing in the context that if you learn to look at things deeply enough, it will by itself created the, tra the transformation that's needed that it does not have to be a journey it can happen instantaneously if you know how to look deeply enough then you don't have to go through the whole process for example there's this beautiful story of uh, uh, ashoka a king in india an ancient king who spread buddhism to many parts of the the south asian continent he was a warrior who was in ba battling and winning and in this is a uh, war of Kalinga, that's the place where the battle took place. And that it is said that he stood there with his sword dripped in blood and just looked around at the chaos and loss of life that he saw. And something about what he saw with the kind of death that he saw it and shifted something within him dramatically. And in that, that was the day he dropped his sword, never to pick up anything around violence again. And for a king to not be given to violence is an unthinkable thing at that time because you have to protect your borders. And he managed to do that. And he, he grew one of the largest empires in this country and spread Buddhism and, this, and the aspects of peace in so many places. 
similar story of Buddha also. Like when he goes out and sees, uh, you know, when Siddhartha sees the, the, the sick and the dying, the ability with which that he's able to see, the depth with which he's able to see sparks something. And then that starts a process or it can happen instantaneously like Ashoka. So it can happen in any way, but it is that depth of perception that we're really looking at. So one is to experience something that shifts. Okay, now I want to ask the right questions in life. I want to look at the right things. But once I start in that direction, I've set the direction. Now I want to build the right tools for taking up the journey, right? Whether it is trying to build my perception or whether I'm trying to prepare my body for the process, mind for the process, emotional for the process, and energies for the process. I have different tools that I pick up. It could be self-help books. It could be things online. It could be yoga. It could be 10,000 different things. And, and today we don't have a problem of information uh, because we are reconnected and we have lots of resources. The challenge is, and in my experience, I have struggled with this big time because the challenge is to take a tool and to apply it without a break. No matter what we take up, the practice will not bear fruit unless we keep at it. Right? And that's the biggest pandemic that I see around wellness that's happening today, because there is no steadiness that we are able to build. Our attention spans have decreased. There's too many options. You know, uh, in the psychology of choices, somebody said, if you say you go to a store and have like 10 different soaps to choose from, you can pick a soap bar and say, okay, I'm going to pick this. If there's just two, it's, it sort of feels like you don't have choices. Maybe you have five or 10, you feel like you've made a choice. But if you go into a super mega store and you see like a thousand soap choices, you know, soap bar choices, now the mind gets overwhelmed. I don't know what to pick and I go into some kind of freeze mode. And uh, I think something like that might also be happening with this excessive dependence and imbalance that you've done with the information era. The too much information is available. And, I, and I, I often in my programs start my programs by saying that there is no new things. If you're here for new shopping, then it is not going to be the place because everything that needs to be said, everything that has to be done has already been said and done by somebody in some context somewhere in history, right? But I, all I can do is that we can journey together in our context and see what can shift within us in our experience. And again, it comes back to um, how we perceive life, how we are able to bring attention to our lives. And that will only happen if we take a tool and work at it. We cannot, if we don't, and nobody can make us do it, right? You can have coaches, you can have, uh, I, I work in the coaching space and we, I, one aspect is to give them the right kind of practices, which I enjoy doing, uh, and then supporting them, motivating them, doing it. But no matter what is done, uh, the, the saying goes that you can take the horse to the water, the, the horse has to drink the water. You cannot make it drink it. And it's true for me also. I've broken my practices. It just doesn't flower unless you keep at it. And that, that key uh, is, is something that maybe people call self-discipline, other things, but it essentially is a question of attention, right? It's about keeping my priorities straight. It's about remembering that this is important for me in life and this is what I'm going towards. And I may not like it today. I, I might not feel like it today. It might not be exciting for me today, but I remember what I'm doing this for and I'm going to keep at it. I'm going to keep steady at it, right? So I think... That's the kind of focus and, and centeredness. In, in yoga, it's called samadhi, samadhi, which means it is a state of equanimity that no matter what happens, I'm, there might be a storm I'm in, but I learn to be in the eye of the storm. That no matter what life is throwing at me, no matter what kind of prayers and craziness is happening at me, I can always learn to be in the center of the storm. I'm still experiencing the storm. I'm still present to the storm, but I myself am not caught up in the storm. And that's a quality that comes when we learn to deepen our sense of attention. And once that is there, when, when I'm not held back by my fears and my insecurities, then I'm going to go out and unleash myself into the world. And that's the true way to become alive, right? Truly alive. Uh, and uh, that's what my work is all about. And I'm, we're trying different things, but there is one key aspect of this work that I don't have in my hands. It's entirely up to the individual to figure this out. All, all the rest of it is to try and sharpen that aspect of us, right? So having said that, we'll go into the process now. Uh, we'll do a very simple uh, three-step process. One would be uh, connecting the breath and the body. Okay. Uh, so I just I give you an overview of what we're going to do first. And uh, when we start the process, uh, maybe then Nathan, you, you can like pause people from popping in when we're doing the process. But when the instructions are going on, if somebody wants to join in, that's fine. Um, so. 
what we'll try and do is if you have a small space to move around i think we've been sitting for too long and listening so we'll try and move around a little bit um we will try and initially move our arms with the breath okay i'll give you the instructions while we are doing this but the first part will be just to see if you can match your body movement with the breath this is very basic stuff but to see if you can just connect your body and breath without uh forcing your breath your breath the important thing to do is not to touch your breath okay you let it happen the way it's happening you move your body in tune with your breath so this is the challenge for you as you're doing this whole process to see if you can just be with the breath try not to elongate it or pull it down consciously let it happen the way it's happening right and see if you can align your body with the breath and see how that experience is we'll also do a little bit of walking it's called synchronized breath walking and the way we'll do this is also uh, very simple what we'll do is um i'm just thinking with the time that we have i have 30 minutes more no okay so we'll do i'll give you an overview i'll repeat the instructions again so what we'll do is as you take an in breath we take two steps okay so i'll tell you breathe in breathe out okay so when you are going you can you can change your steps in the space that breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out okay and we walk initially like that you don't change your breath again you just change the pace of your walking and then we go breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out and we do that and then finally we'll go breathe in in uh, i would just say breathe okay so because that's just one word so it's breathe in and out breathe in and out breathe in and out breathe in and out okay when we do this and when i'm giving you the instructions then it will also help but for now just to give you a general overview because i don't want to interrupt the process when it's happening so this is just a way of connecting your body with the breath this is one part we'll do the second part we'll do is a is an ancient um process a yogic process called the humming bee breath okay i'll show you a very quick demo of it you can just pay attention it's a very simple process um i think i'll show it you instead of showing a video because we don't have much time so the way you do it is just sit cross legged if you can if you cannot if your body is not working uh, allowing you to sit cross legged or if you have any medical conditions you can simply sit uh, on a chair and keep your spine comfortably erect and keep your palms open Okay. and uh, we we won't be doing this now i'll repeat the instructions while we're doing it the idea is to inhale through the nose okay that we'll be doing consciously so it's not natural breathing inhale slowly fully and gently but complete inhalation as you exhale you just keep your mouth closed and make a sound it's just um you make the sound of no? mm, that's all you don't have to do anything else there's no 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 other uh you know mm. syllable that you need to attend just mm, that's all mm. all right and try not to clench your teeth that's all you need to do and we'll repeat this so inhalation exhalation you have to extend as much as possible with a steady uh mm, sound if your if your if your voice is going mm, 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 that means you're pushing too hard okay so you don't go that far you just go mm, and end it all right and then again you inhale through the nose make the sound then exhalation inhale through the nostril exhale through the sound with the sound all right the third part you finish that and just watch your breath for some time okay breath watching is fairly simple so i'm not going to give specific instructions for that you just close your eyes just be with your breath and just stay present nothing else until i ask you to open your eyes you will just stay with the breath Are the instructions clear? So there's three parts. The third part is breath watching, which is very simple. The second one is the humming bee breath, which is just inhale through your nostril, exhale with a sound, just make a hmm sound. All right. And the first part is what we're going to have a few instructions, which is basically just moving the body. Let's just do the walk then. Okay. So we'll take a few minutes to stretch our bodies and then just do the walk, and then we'll move into uh, the breath, and then we'll sit with the breath watching. Are the instructions vaguely at least you have a picture about this and again repeat the instructions i'll also be doing this with you to some extent and the important thing is if you can allow yourself to be uninterrupted during the process it will be fantastic especially if you have 
children or pets in the house, especially when you're sitting in the, the humming bee, bee or when you're trying to breath watch, try not to be physically disturbed, okay? Depending on it's, we're not doing going that deep today, but uh, for some of you, because I can't see all of you, it might naturally happen at a deeper level. If it happens deep enough and you physically get disturbed, it disturbs your energies internally. Okay, so we recommend not to do that. So if you can find a little bit of, you don't need much space. I'm just going to use like, uh, you know, like four by four feet is what I've ha I have here. So that's what I'm going to use. So you can pick a space that's cozy, small, where you have less disturbance and then we'll go together. Uh, can you also like see if you can keep me on speaker so you can hear my, if, unless you're using, uh, you know, ear, wireless earphones, you can just uh, keep me on speaker and we'll do it with the instructions, okay? All right, I'm gonna turn this around and see.